Uniform circular motion is another type of motion in two dimensions in which there is an acceleration. What we mean by circular motion, of course, is that an object is moving in a perfect circle. And a circle, of course, has a center with a radius so that all points on the circle are equidistant from the center. So if the object starts out here at time t1, there's a radius. And if it's later at t2, there's another radius vector that I can draw here. By uniform, we mean that the object is moving at constant speed. So it is true that the velocity vector is changing, because at one time, the velocity vector points off down and to the right, whereas at a later time, the velocity vector points down and to the left. It's not to say that the velocity in magnitude has changed. In other words, the speed is constant, but only the direction is changing. And since acceleration is defined as the change of a velocity vector over time, or you can start just by writing over increments of time. If you prefer not to think about the derivative, anything that changes the velocity vector results in acceleration. Let's take a look at where the acceleration is coming from, because we can see the velocity vector is changing in direction. How does that correspond to a change in acceleration? or it, it, into the creation of acceleration. I'm going to first envision a time interval over which there's an angle theta that's subtended. So this position vector of the object starts out here, eventually moves down here. The length of that position vector is always the same. It's the length of the radius of the circle but the radial vector moves from there to there. As a result, there's an angle theta that, uh, that rises. How far will the object go? Well, it will travel an arc length, s. And we know that s is equal to r times theta, where r is the length of the, uh, the radius of the circle. Theta is the angle subtended. And this equals the speed times delta t. Because s is the distance it's traveling. If I'm moving at speed v all the way through, then I'm just incrementally stepping along. From which I learned that theta is v over r. times delta t. We'll need that result in just a little while. But we haven't yet answered how it is that this results in an acceleration. It's helpful to think about the two velocity vectors v1 at an early time and if this is v2 at a later time, I remember that acceleration is related to delta v over delta t. What is delta v? Delta v is v2 minus v1 over delta t, where delta t is just t2 minus t1. If I think about how to compute v2 minus v1, I can put v1 here, 
and V2 here. Delta V is this vector. Because if delta V is V2 minus V1, then V1 plus delta V has to equal V2. So this says V1 plus delta V is equal to V2. I always find it a little challenging to exactly get straight whether my delta V should point to the left here in this picture or to the right. But if I think about this subtraction expression up here, delta V is V2 minus V1. That was what helps me because I think V1 plus delta V has to equal V2. This angle between that point right there and that point there where the object is at those two different times is theta and that as a result means this angle will be theta. So how does that teach me about the acceleration? I'm going to draw a little dotted line right here. And I want to learn something about the side, the length of this side of the tri of a, this little triangle right in here, using that side and the sine of an angle. So this angle over here is theta over two, and this angle over here is theta over two. As a result, I know that sine of theta over two, which is always opposite over hypotenuse, is equal to delta v over. Actually, I'm just going to write v, because v2 and v1 are vectors, but they have the same magnitude. So if I'm just speaking about magnitude, then, oh, excuse me, this is delta v over 2 divided by v. So delta v, over, delta v is this entire length of the base of this triangle, of the bigger triangle, but the base of the small right triangle is delta v over 2, and that is length v. There's an approximation that is important to remember that for very small angles, we can approximate the sine of an angle by the angle itself. This is only when measured in radians. So we have to be a little bit careful. We can't express theta in degrees. And as a result, I can take this equation right here and rewrite it as theta over 2 is delta v over 2 over v. Or I can write that as theta equals delta v over v. Previously, we learned that theta is equal to v over r times delta t. And now I'm going to set these two things equal. That's delta v over v, which means that delta v over delta t equals v squared over r. So the acceleration is v squared over r in magnitude. It's in the minus r hat direction. Why did I write that? Delta v, you notice, points back toward the center of the circle. Therefore, an acceleration, which is always delta v over delta v over delta t has to point back toward the side of the circle as well.
And the interesting thing is that this acceleration vector gets larger in magnitude the faster I'm going, or the smaller the radius of curvature. This is why it's challenging for cars to take a tight turn, because r is very small. And as a result, v squared over r gets very big. And cars aren't able to make the swerve. Or you can say it's very challenging for cars to make a tight turn at high speeds, because when v squared over r gets very big, very big, then the acceleration to make the swerve has to be very big, and the car can't do it. So this acceleration has the right trend. It, it gets bigger when v gets bigger, and it gets bigger when r gets smaller, and it points back toward the center of the circle of motion.